Japanese Father's Day, and I know Ms. Yang, you know, would love to be with her father, uh, and yet on that very day, uh, he was taken away by, uh, by the security apparatus of the Chinese government. We know that he wasn't formally arrested until early September of 2013. Mr. Guo's detention appears to be a reprisal for his support of government transparency and calls for accountability. In recent months, Beijing has cracked down harshly on dozens of similarly minded advocates seeking political reforms. Mr. Guo is a, not a newcomer to public advocacy, nor to suffering punishments and sacrifice for his work. A former novelist and businessman, he first became widely known in 2005 for organizing protests of land seizures on the outskirts of Guangzhou City. In 2007, a Chinese court sentenced the outspoken Mr. Guo to five years imprisonment on charges of illegal publishing. He and his supporters maintained the charges were fabricated to silence him and to silence the others. In late 2011, he was released. Since that time, he's continued to participate in China's rights defense movement. He continued to express himself freely in the hopes of advancing human rights. He has protested along reporters fighting the Southern Weekly's heavy-handed censorship and vocally supported recent calls for greater government transparency and an end to corruption. Now Mr. Guo is being held on charges of, quote, assembling a crowd to disrupt order in a public place. This alleged crime, along with many others, is all too often employed unjustly against the courageous men and women who want accountability or are pressing for change. For simply asking for transparency, he is suspected of disrupting the harsh order that Beijing enforces. Notwithstanding China's own criminal procedure rules, authorities have denied Mr. Guo access to a lawyer and have failed to properly notify his family. Once again, China continues to enforce its legal protections haphazardly, if at all, when punishing or silencing those who advocate for reform and change. Today's hearing on the heroism and the sacrifices of Mr. Guo, and that's what we're focusing on. This brave man needs to be lifted up. The United States Congress is focusing and expressing its profound respect for him as well as for his family. Sadly, Mr. Guo is one among many who are suffering in China today. In recent months, Chinese authorities have cracked down on dozens of human rights advocates participating in a so-called New Citizens Movement. The movement, which began forming last year, has been described as a loose network of like-minded academics and lawyers who hold informal gatherings and promote various issues, including transparency and anti-corruption efforts. These detentions signifies Chinese citizens' growing resolve and Beijing's growing fears. Mr. Guo and many others throughout China want and deserve change. They want accountability. They want transparency. They want basic human rights and the respect for those rights, and they want justice. And increasingly, they are willing to endure even greater risks and willing to sacrifice their own personal security to speak freely. We are fortunate today to be joined by Ms. Zhang Jing, Mr. Guo's courageous wife, and Ms. Yang Ti Ni Guo, I hope I said that correctly, his wonderful daughter. We look forward to their testimony, their insights, and their defense of a beloved father and a beloved daughter. We are also blessed to have with us two giants in the human rights field, the Reverend Bob Fu and Mr. Chen Quan Jin, who will be speaking to us via Skype. He was supposed to be here personally, uh, but was not feeling well enough to be here. Uh, and then we're also joined by Mr. Kumar, himself a political prisoner and suffered uh, for his beliefs uh, so many years ago and has been a frequent, very significant contributor uh, to our uh, efforts on the committee and for the Congress itself. With this current crackdown of Chinese human rights activists, it's important to understand the brave and bold people challenging the Chinese state. And they're doing it in a nonviolent and a benign way, and yet they are harshly retaliated against. Inspiring figures like Mr. Guo puts another heroic face on these detentions. His face, however, does, not, does more than just contextualize the current crackdown or a details to a prisoner file. It causes us to wonder about ourselves, about our commitment to human rights, 
and the risk we are willing to take for those around us and in persecuted countries like the People's Republic of China. Mr. Guo now faces an uncertain punishment, and we must determine our own human rights commitment to him and to others. In July 2013, Mr. Guo wrote about a 1989 Tiananmen activist now facing the possibility of even more prison time. He wrote that Yao Chang King is an important symbol of the 1989 generation who, in the face of danger, takes action, bears responsibility, persists, pushes forward, and becomes more evolved, involved. This is how one should behave and shoulder his fate. Despite the hardships and the odds, Mr. Guo reminds us that we, members of Congress, living in the safe harbors of the West, must shoulder our responsibilities and our burdens, and far too often we don't. We're here today to accept our responsibility to Mr. Guo and other courageous Chinese human rights advocates. We hope that we also, in his words, will take action, bear responsibility, persist, push forward, and evolve like these heroes. He reminds us that is that that is the only way to behave. We hope that the Chinese government is listening. We hope the Chinese citizens seeking change are listening. And we hope Mr. Guo is listening. And we hope President Obama and our administration are listening as well and will do everything in their power to help free Mr. Guo and others fighting for human rights. We hope the U.S. Congress is listening uh, so that uh, he will be free and be out of that terrible, terrible gulag state. I'd like to now yield to Mr. Stockman for any opening comments you might have. I want to t thank the chairman for putting this together, and as I said to the to television cameras, uh, the Chinese government would have greater respect from the people if they respected the people. And the fact that they are continually uh, suppressing their own people, and now it seems that uh, very much, uh, according to ind independent reports, are increasing the uh, persecution of their own citizens. This is the wrong direction to go. I think prior to the Olympics, they were trying to be more open and, and more receiving of people's inputs. But since the Olympics, it looks like there is an increase in persecution in China. And uh, we as congressmen need to speak out and support those that are being persecuted. And I thank again the chairman for offering this hearing for us to uh, put a highlight on, on exactly what is going on in China. Mr. Stockman, thank you very much. Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is good to have you here. Good to see many of you again. And as we uh, look at this particular case, highlighting this case, I think uh, what the American people need to hear and quite frankly what the world needs to hear is, is the injustice that we, we see, not uh, only in, uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Guo, but uh, really in terms of human rights in general in China. Uh, was part of a briefing just the other day as we started to look at, at the freedom of expression and how the story is not getting told and uh, it is being subtly and at times not so subtly uh, hidden from the, the citizens of China and from the rest of the world. According to the World Press Freedom Index, China ranks 173rd out of 179 countries in terms of free press. Uh, that's a statistic that is unacceptable for a world leader and for a member of the UN Security Council. And as we see the great reforms that have been promised as part of the 2012 uh, elections, yet we hear today and we will hear today how those reforms have yet to, uh, to take place. And, uh, and so while these matters may be inherently an internal issue for China, uh, as members of the United States Congress, it's our duty to uh, expose the challenges that the Chinese citizens face and urge the government uh, to implement the necessary reforms. Uh, I want to thank the chairman for his unrelenting effort on behalf of people that perhaps have no voice other than his to uh, stand up for human rights. And uh, I'm proud to join him arm in arm to uh, fight that battle. And with that I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meadows, thank you very much. Uh, we're joined by a member of the China Commission, a distinguished member of the House of Representatives, Mr. Pittenger, uh, who is here because of his deep concern for human rights in China as well as the rest of the world and religious freedom in particular. Mr. Pittenger. The last 30 years, you have been a remarkable leader for the cause of human rights and religious liberties. 
we gave up a lot in the late 1990s when we gave up most favored trading nation status. And we have no longer had the leverage on human rights and religious liberties. I regret that we did that. There was a lot of business pressure in response to that. But nonetheless, we, you all have fought a valiant war. I have been over there a number of times, headed back there in January, and would do everything to support your efforts. Very dedicated people who want to uh, present the gospel in a fearless way. So God bless you for your service. I know that there's many here who pray for you and who support you in your work, and the only eternity will know the life that you've lived and for what you fought for and what you have given and committed yourself to. Thank you. Pitcher, thank you so very much for your eloquence and for all of my colleagues for their steadfast support for fundamental human rights and for being so consistent. Um, it is just so admirable and, and so encouraging. I'd like to now introduce our distinguished witnesses, beginning first with uh, uh, with the wife of Mr. Uh, Guo Feijiang. Uh, her name is Yang Jing. Uh, she is a political asylee from China in 2006 after her husband was arrested and badly tortured. She wrote open letters to the president of China and to President Bush to expose the brutality and torture that was happening to her husband. She also called for human rights organizations and the media to recognize and consider Chen Quanzhen's case while he was in jail. She and her husband's activities caused her to endure sustained pressure and persecution, so she came to the United States. She now lives in Mr. Stock Stockman's state, uh, the great state of Texas, and is a full-time university student there. And thank you for being here, and I look forward, along with my colleagues, to your, your testimony. We'll then hear from Ms. Yang uh, Tianjo, uh, who is the daughter of Guo, Guo Feijiang. Uh, she came to the U.S. four years ago, is now a high school student in Texas, where uh, she won uh, the President's Educational Award for Outstanding Academic Excellence 2010. She loves music and art. She has drawn pictures of her father and composed a piano piece to express her hope that he can gain freedom in China. And we again thank her for uh, coming forward to speak out in defense of her dad. Uh, we'll then hear from Mr. Chen Quanzhen via Skype, who would have been here but was not feeling well enough to travel. Uh, as we all know, a valiant Chinese human rights activist who worked on a variety of human rights issues, especially the forced abortion issue. Blind from early age and self-taught in the law, uh, Mr. Chen is frequently described as a barefoot lawyer who advocated for the victims of forced abortion and sterilization and the welfare of the women and the poor and the disabled. He is best known for exposing massive abuses in official family planning policy, often involving violence and forced abortions. Imprisoned unjustly and tortured, first in prison and then under house arrest, he finally escaped house arrest in his rural town in East China, Shandong province, and made it to the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. A legendary escape, the kind of stuff that superheroes are made of. The world watched, and after negotiations, he was allowed to come to the U.S., and began a law fellowship at, at New York University. He began, uh, recently became a distinguished senior fellow in human rights at the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, as well as distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies at the Catholic University of America, and also a senior distinguished advisor at the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice. We will then hear from Mr. Uh, Pastor Bob Fu, who was a leader in the 1989 student democracy movement in Tiananmen Square and later became a house church pastor and founder along with his wife. In 1996, uh, he was authorities arrested uh, Pastor Fu and imprisoned them for their work. After their release, they escaped to the United States in 2002, founded China Aid Association. China Aid monitors and reports on religious freedom in China and provides a forum for discussion among experts on religion law and human rights in China. Pastor Fu is frequently interviewed by media outlets around the world. He has an incredible uh, understanding of the Chinese dictatorship, uh, but he also uh, amazingly prays for not just the victims, but also for the tormentors uh, and loves them both. Uh, absolutely amazing man. We'll then hear from T. Kumar, uh, who is the uh, Amnesty International's director for international advocacy and a very good friend of this committee. Uh, he has testified before the U.S. Congress on numerous occasions to discuss human rights abuses around the world. 
He has served as a human rights monitor in many Asian countries, as well as in Bosnia, Afghanistan, Guatemala, Sudan, and South Africa. He also served as director of several refugee ships uh, and camps. Uh, T. Kumar was a political prisoner for over five years in Sri Lanka for his peaceful human rights activities. Amnesty International adopted him as a prisoner of conscience, and now he does that for others, uh, and he does it so well. He started his legal studies in prison and eventually became an attorney at law and devoted his entire practice to defending political prisoners. Ms. Yang, if you could proceed. Honorable Chairman, Vice Chairman, Congressman, and uh, everyone here. I'm wife of Guo Feixiong. My name is Zhang Qing. I'm very thankful uh, to every one of you to have this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, my husband's case to you. And also, I'm glad to tell you about my husband, about his activities in defending human rights, his ideals, and his personality and character. Today,中国人权状况进一步的恶化，在今年夏季开始的新一轮的中国官方对中国呃新公民运动的镇压中，郭飞雄于今年八月八号第四次被拘捕。and in today's channel, actually, human rights uh, has been continued to uh, uh, deteriorate. And in the new round of crackdown on the human rights movement, my husband uh, has been detained for the fourth time. And the charge is that uh, uh, to motivate people for illegal gathering. And uh, in 2009, he publicly made the speech demanding for the freedom of expression in China. He believes that uh, in the West or in East, uh, the, human, uh, the freedom of expression is the basic human right. Uh, 政府对郭飞雄的案子就没有任何的法律手程序 There has never been any legal due process for my husband's case after he got arrested 律师和家人都无法见到他 His lawyers and family members have been denied access to visit him 至今已经82天 And it has been 83 days now 而且看不到何时是尽头 And we cannot see the end of, of this case. And of course, we don't know how long this will last. I don't, we don't know what will happen to him if the international community will not show their concern uh, to this case. Uh, and and my husband, Guo Feishun, got involved in the pro-democracy movement in 2003 and got arrested for the first time in 2005. And in 2005, he was speaking out for the farmers who were losing their land because of the government illegal seizure. And in 2006, he came to the States to attend a le uh, law conference. And many people actually uh, advised him to stay in the United States. But he uh, looked at the democracy and the freedom in this country, he made the commitment to bring back the ideals for freedom of expression and the democracy back to the Chinese people. So he went back. He was clearly aware of the poss possibility that he would be arrested again if he would return, but he still made the decision to return. 
从二零零三年参与维权运动至今十年。It has been ten years since the、uh, year 2003 he got involved in pro-democracy movement. 有五年半的时间是待在监狱里。He has spent、uh, five years and a half in jail. 他一直走在民间运动的前沿。And he has always been at the most frontier fighting for democracy movement. 他不仅是一个行动家，也是一个理论家。And he is not only promote、uh, the theory of、uh, democracy movement, but actually he is a doer、uh, for this movement. 对中国民间运动有很大的影响力。He has、uh, made a huge impact upon the pro democracy movement in China. 他写文章四十多篇，总结维权工作中的经验。He has composed more than forty articles. Uh, summarizing and、uh, thinking about the pro-democracy movement in China. His pro-democracy activity directly caused him to be under severe pressure. And it is because of all his、uh, activities that the government now is torturing him in jail. He has been in jail four times. 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 And even、uh, our family members has been、uh, tortured、uh, as well. 其中最严酷的酷刑是中国警方使用高压电警棍电击男性生殖器，而且自抄了这个郭飞雄的冤案五年。And、uh, one of the、uh, horrible tortures is that the policeman used uh, uh, electric rod. Uh, to torture his uh, uh, genitals. They want to use torture to destroy his freedom of the freedom of the And they appealed to this torture to crack down, to crush his will for democracy and for freedom. But he will never change his、uh, commitment. Gu Feixiong is a man who is a man who is a man who is a man who is a man. So he will never surrender to such pressure, and he is really, truly a model fighting for democracy and freedom. He has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike for more than one hundred days. And he has been on hunger strike 二零一一年九月十三号，郭飞雄在服满五年冤狱出狱后。And 2011, after five years, uh, uh, been tortured in jail. 他继续从事维权活动。But he continued, uh, his uh, human rights activity. 呼吁中国有言论自由。Asking Chinese government、uh, to give back、uh, the freedom of expression. To the Chinese people. He also organized a series of activities to investigate the Li Wangyang murder and the death of Li Wangyang. And he organized a series of activities for the human rights cases. He called on the Chinese government to approve the Human Rights Convention and the Human Rights Declaration. And he asked the Chinese government to approve the covenant of the human rights, that is, the covenant of the United Nations. And asking Chinese officials to publicly、um, tell public、uh, their properties. In 2006, the Chinese government for the anti-revolutionary movement and the new movement. In 2006 and、uh, this year, in the both the crackdown、uh, of the Chinese government upon the human rights movement. Guo Feixiong 都是受到最严酷的酷刑。And my husband Guo was、uh, the one that has been tortured、uh, mostly. 受到最非法的对待。And has been treated、uh, illegally all the time. 所以，我今天来到这里，请奥巴马政府、美国国会为郭飞雄案发出呼吁。So here I'm here today to ask Obama administration to speak on my husband's case. 请奥巴马。和美国国务院公开提到郭飞雄的名字，公开发表声明支持无罪释放郭飞雄。I ask、uh, Obama administration and uh, uh, American officials to speak openly、uh, for my husband and、uh, ask Chinese government 
to release my husband without any condition. 希望美国国会通过决议案和其他有效方式跟中国方面联系，转达对郭凤雄。郭凤雄案的高度关注。I also appeal to American Congress that uh, uh, within your power, and you can do something for my husband, and to talk to the Chinese government, and to uh, express your concern. 呃，推动并支持无罪释放郭飞雄。And then to um, ask the Chinese government to release my husband. 呃，希望美国驻华大使、美国总理事馆能够向中国政府当局要求，呃，会见郭飞雄。I also ask the American Embassy to China uh, to meet my husband. Uh, because uh, both lawyers and the family members are denied uh, the right to visit him. And, and uh, America is the leading uh, country uh, for the human rights in this world. And uh, it serves as uh, like a lighthouse uh, for the whole world. So the American administration and Congress have the obligation to support those who fight for human rights in China. 美国政府、美国国会给中国政府施加压力，来蹬足中国政府释放所有的被关押的政治犯、良心犯和宗教犯。So I also ask the American uh, uh, administration and the American Congress uh, to talk and put the pressure upon Chinese government to release all of those prisoners of consciousness. 感谢。Thank you. Thank you so very much for that extraordinarily powerful testimony. Uh, and we will follow up. We will do a letter. We will include the entirety of this hearing record to President Obama, to Secretary Kerry, um, and to Ambassador Gary Block, our ambassador to the People's Republic of China and other interested parties within the administration. And we will contact the Chinese ourselves as a committee. So thank you for those very tangible follow-up things for us to do. Um, and I do have other questions later, but now we'll go to Ms. Yang. Dear Honorable Chairman, members of Congress, and friends, my name is Yang Tianzhao, and my American name is Sarah. My dad is Guo Feixiong. I'm here to thank the Congress and Congressman Smith for giving me this opportunity to speak here. The last time I saw my dad was about seven years ago. It was in 2006, and I was only 10. I remember that he brought me this video game, and we play it almost every day during that summer. However, However, on September the 14th, when I came back from school, he was gone, and I have not seen him since that date. I have not, I did not even have a chance to say bye or I love you to him. Over the past seven years, I have dreamed about him a lot. I dreamed that he would play that video game with me so we can pass level five together. But they were only dreams. The next day, I always found myself in tears. I got to know about my dad's condition from my mom's conversation with friends. My mom would not talk about my dad's news in front of me because she thought it was too heavy for a 10 years old girl to accept. But I still listened to them anyway. And to be honest, they were extremely heavy, sad, and shocking. I heard that he was incarcerated for five years during those five years, the government transferred him to many different places and used numerous different torture to against him. I was always so deeply hurt when I heard about them. In 2009, we moved to the United States of America. In 2011, my dad got out of jail. The day he was out, we talked on the phone. I literally cried when I heard his voice. I have been longing to hear this voice for five years, and I could finally do that. Over the past two years, I talked to my dad through Skype. He gave me advice for life, and I showed him my artwork. A few years ago, I drew my dad in this miniature cartoon form, 
and he immediately complained about the one short leg and one long leg when he saw it. Recently, my art skill have improved so much that he applauded my artwork. However, he still pushes me to move forward. He still wants me to draw like some of the most famous and brilliant artists like Da Vinci and Michelangelo, etc. But the good times did not last long. He was captured again on August the 8th, 2013. And I heard that that day was the Father's Day in China. Again, I do not remember our last conversation. Again, I do not get to say a formal goodbye to him. Again, I have not heard his voice for about 70 days. Again, I miss him so much. Right now, I have a watercolor painting of my dad. I finished in September. I'm sorry that I didn't bring it today. I hand it on my wall so I can see his face every day. In this painting, he is smiling. In his memory, that's what he looked like every day when we were together. Also, I composed a piano piece called The Cosmos. This is a piece for my dad. I will always laugh at him when my dad jokes that he fell asleep to my piano playing. However, words, drawings, and music cannot express how much I miss him. My dad is a great man. He is my hero. He has helped so many people. He, a man who pursues democracy, works so hard to improve the law of China. I, his daughter, always want my dad to have the freedom that he works so hard to achieve for others. I always want him to be safe and free. President Obama, you also have two daughters. You are also a human rights lawyer. I wish that President Obama can send a request to China to free my father. I do not know what has happened to him in the jail for the past two months. I am so worried about his health. So I hope that the Congress would talk in ch to the Chinese government and secure my father's freedom. Thank you very much. Ms. Yang, thank you so very much for that testimony. And, um, tears, deeply hurt, and then the water painting where he's smiling on your wall. That, that is so touching, and I hope that the president, the vice president, our own leadership here in the House and Senate will, will act. Uh, we certainly will as a subcommittee. Uh, we will do everything we can to secure your father's release. Uh, and, and your testimony is so moving. No one can hear that and not be moved. So thank you, you and your mom as well. Um, we do have some difficulties still. Uh, we we're going to have to switch to audio only, although we'll keep the um, the visual as long as we can to hear the great Chen Quan Chen uh, testify. Um, so I'd like to now yield to Mr. Chen. Hearing no objection uh, that we're just doing it by way of audio, we will proceed. Hey, Well, can I just say, Bob Fu will now use his cell phone in a way that he did twice when Chen, Mr. Chen was in a hospital under arrest. Uh, he couldn't leave, obviously. The, the hospital room was filled with, uh, with Chinese police, and Bob Fu got through to him, and that's where he made his famous appeal uh, to come to the United States, and within hours he was given approval. Bob, if you could proceed with that. Okay. Mm. 
耳机，这样可以了吗？好，你说吧。哎，听到吗？啊，可以了。好的。啊，尊敬的主席先生，各位人权议员，各位朋友。Dear Honorable Chairman, Honorable Members of the Human Rights Committee and friends, greetings to all of you. So, 十月一日，因践行公民权利而被抓捕的人权勇士朱辉群先生已被关押八十三天了。Uh, human rights uh, fighter Mr. Guo Feishun has been detained for 83 days now. Wait, you get the sword? Wait. It has been eight times that the Chinese government uh, has denied uh, his uh, basic rights uh, to see the lawyer. This is a clear violation of Chinese own laws and the citizens' basic civil rights. We have no idea whether he's alive or he's dead. In 2005, Guo Feishong, Gao Zisheng, and I were persecuted by the Chinese government almost at the same time. And, and today, uh, Gao Zisheng is still in jail, and uh, his family members are forbidden to meet him. And Guo Feishun was arrested again only after he was released less than two years ago uh, from his last imprisonment. So today, this uh, Communist Party is showing the whole world it has no idea to change and will continue to fight against the human rights. So we shouldn't have any illusion uh, towards the Chinese Communist Party anymore. And the trial of Ms. Liu Ping, Mr. Wei Zhongping, and Li Shiguan in Jiangxi yesterday is deemed by the citizens in China as uh, the evil trials against uh, the good. In the name of social stability, maintenance, a number of citizens, petitioners, and the activists were kidnapped, tortured, and arrested uh, quite frequently. The lawyers who were supposed to represent these three activists, activists on trial were forced to cancel their legal contract with uh, their clients because they couldn't uh, meet up with uh, his, their clients. Uh, 
The report released by the Freedom House last week shows the crackdown against the freedom of speech, internet freedom, and media censorship in China has already extended beyond China's borders. And uh, this crackdown was uh, actually ironed out uh, uh, since the spring this year, and since then, 100, more than 150 people got arrested. And the communist regime is really only using this trial against these three activists in Jiangxi as a test to the international community to see how we would respond. And then I believe it will get worse and worse if we don't respond to take proper actions. In his the first arrest, uh, Guo Feixun was uh, tortured severely. And so this really should concern and worry everyone this time because uh, he has been arrested for so long without any legal rights and his lawyers and family members cannot uh, visit him. And the freedom belongs to the brave people. And this illegal trial against these three innocent uh, Chinese citizens really occasioned the strongest uh, protest among the Chinese people. Nobody's rights will be guaranteed without a sound system. It is my hope that the United States of America international community will help assist the Chinese people in getting onto the path of freedom, democracy, and constitutionalism as soon as possible. And the most urgent task before us is to achieve internet freedom in China. And the communist regime right now is uh, undermining internet freedom and restrict the free access of information. And the internet censorship is overwhelming, and a large number of internet uh, policemen are hired to censor, block, delete postings online. Which is a blatant violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights according to the Article 19. This article states that everyone has the right to seek, receive, and import information and ideals through any media and regardless of frontiers.
Hillary Clinton once stated clearly that the policy of the United States is to support an internet that allows every human being equal access to knowledge, to the thoughts, and dedicating itself to the promotion of internet freedom. If this policy of the United States can truly implement it, that will be a great contribution to the freedom in China as well as to the whole world. So right now, it is a high time we provide assistance to the freedom-loving people in totalitarian countries and tell them the internet version of the Berlin Wall. Therefore, I suggest to all the Congress uh, and the administration of uh, every free nation to increase the invest, the invest in funding and uh, to help uh, develop some software so that uh, we can break through the file, file walls, such as uh, FOE, FreeGate, or UltraSurf, which are all very effective. I learned that the U.S. Congress has a $700 million budget for this purpose, but only less than 3% is uh, uh, spent on breaking through Chinese firewalls. Therefore, it is very urgent for Congress to increase the budget for the Internet of Freedom in China. And secondly, uh, it is my suggestion that the official ju judicial and administrative organs must join hands in establishing a mechanism uh, for human rights violators and so that we can stop them, set up a global database of human rights violators, including the 610 office, 610 office of the Chinese Communist Party and the Family Planning Commission at all levels of the government, expand, establish, and strictly implement current laws similar to the Malinsky Act, which prohibits the entrance of Russian human rights violators into the United States. And we need to freeze their assets in the United States and abroad, put an end to the history of those vicious officials. 
when, when they can enjoy the freedom in uh, overseas, like in America, while they can exercise their tyranny in their home countries. So we need to set up a trans-congregational human rights alliance of free countries and convene regularly and invite civilians, human rights defenders, victims, and their family members, and authorized agents to share their stories. So we, uh, uh, the people in the free world, we need to speak up and stand up for all those uh, human rights uh, fighters and uh, to show uh, our concern and to invite them to join hands and uh, fight together. And fourthly, we needed to demand the Chinese Communist Party to stop persecuting religious uh, believers and uh, respect their religious freedom. Uh, 120 Tibetan monks have uh, immolated themselves. People in Xinjiang fighting against the tyranny have been shot one after another. And we all know the, the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners and as well as those underground house church uh, Christians. They are all suffering from persecution. All the group, groups mentioned above, they all can get along with other Asians, Europeans, and Americans and earn their respect. Yet, why can't the Chinese Communist regime tolerate them? Fifthly, I call on lawyers, legal experts of the United States and American Bar Association to advocate for human rights lawyers of China and make joint efforts to provide them with some specific legal support and assistance. Sixthly, I hope that the annual U.S.-China Human Rights Dialogue will be practical in advancing human rights and dare to be open and honest. Human rights dialogue should not become a matter of formality and empty talk. Uh, 
And the last, I also wanted to appeal to American people, and you voted all those officials, congressmen, into office. So I appeal to you that you will talk to your congressmen and officials and apply all the resources and the means to help terminate China's uh, evil one-child policy and uh, abortion, forced abortion. Because to force women to abort their babies is a violation of universal human rights. It tramples on women's rights, the right of free choice, and also the sacred right of life. This weak policy results in a severe imbalance in gender ratio and a rapidly aging population. So, so I plead earnestly with you, kind-hearted American people, to take actions right away. And contact uh, your representatives and officials and uh, ask them to show their concern to all the issues as discussed above. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, all the members of the Human Rights Committee, and thank you, everyone present uh, at this uh, uh, hearing. Mr. Chen, thank you very much for your eloquent testimony and for your very detailed list of actionable items. I wonder, will you be able to stay with us, or will you have to go? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I can stay. Thank you. Uh, uh, then we'll ask questions after our final two distinguished witnesses. Uh, Pastor Fu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your years of uh, leadership and um, uh, support for this uh, very important cause for freedom not only in China, but also globally as a voice for this voiceless and for these uh, oppressed uh, people. And today, um, when I entered into this room, uh, I feel both um, gladly and sadly. I'm glad that uh, we still have um, congressional leaders like you, like uh, other uh, members who are still concerned and uh, support uh, this cause, although it's not a popular cause anymore, uh, with the China's economic uh, prosperity and uh, economic uh, stake in the global forum. I'm sad because four years after Guo Fixing's uh, wife and uh, two children uh, were able to come to the United States, and we're still talking about Guo Fixing's freedom. I still remembered in 2009, in a small hotel in Bangkok, I flew there because I heard Miss Zhang Qing, with her two kids, had to escape from China because they could not live a normal life anymore. When Guo Fixing was in prison, was tortured, and the kids could not even find opportunity to get their education, and the wife could not even find a right job for her. And facing the incredible obstacles, 
including the denial of a refugee status from the United Nations, including a refusal to help by the U.S. government officials. And I already booked my return flight to the United States. And I was willing to continue to file petition or appeal to the UN. But seeing, uh, looking at the eyes of these two kids, including Miss Young, Sarah, who is sitting next to me, full of uh, reluctance and fear, and seeing, watching that little boy was playing with me and really begging me to stay with him, to play with him. I just could not leave them behind. Of course, you know, as a friend and a fellow freedom fighter, I would not leave his family members behind by coming back alone. Even that means I have to take what somebody or some people called radical procedures between the letter of the law and my own conscience. So I took them to the United States with some extraordinary procedures, which is written in my memoir, God's Double Agent. I was happy to see the family finally need not to worry about what would happen in the middle of the night, what would happen to the two kids when they walk in the darkness on the road to do shopping, what would happen to their dad in the middle of the night when they woke up. Of course, I want to thank many leaders of this country, especially many citizens in the great state of Texas, where I have been residing since 2004. And even today, several members of the business community, religious community, flow all the way from Texas to come here to show their solidarity and their support for the freedom of Guo Feixin. I want to recognize them. So they are in the midst of this hearing. I want to especially thank Mr. Joe Torres, who is here as the chairman of the board of China Aid, as a business leader, a CPA. Of course, now the Texas, the tax season is approaching. And we all know this sacrifice he has encountered for engaging the Ministry of China Aid by helping these families like Mr. Guo's family. I want to thank Pastor Chad Fuller, who was a um, former official of Homeland Security Department, now a pastor of 6,000 members church who came here also to support the family where the Guo's family are member of that church, the Stonegate Fellowship. I also want to thank Pastor Daniel Stevens on my back, who is my pastor and my fellow co-worker at Mid-Cities Community Church. I still remembered that very day when I heard the mother and uh, children were wandering on the street that was uh, Gao Zhisheng's family. I have to, I wanted to fly there immediately to Bangkok to comfort them, to find a place to stay. But we don't have a budget. So I just emailed Pastor Daniel. I said, you know, could you help? Without hesitation, not a single question even was asked. The next day, I was able to buy the most expensive air tickets, $5,000, to get to Bangkok. That enabled me 
to meet with these family members and comfort them and situate them in a hotel room. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, since the beginning of this year, the environment for freedom of speech in China has rapidly worsened. The Chinese Communist authorities have launched a campaign across China to strictly purge opinions voiced on the internet and other peaceful public forum. Mr. Guo Feijing's arrest was just one of the cases of arbitrary arrest. The official propaganda of the Chinese Communists severely criticized the democratic constitutional, constitutional trends of thought. Besides, the, the Communist Party also severely suppressed the new civil citizen movement. According to incomplete statistics, from the protest incidents to other peaceful petitioning. At least uh, over 100 people across China, some um, even respected writers estimated maybe thousands of Chinese citizens have been arrested, arrested for simply expressing themselves or for a peaceful petitioning in front of the government. There has been a huge increase in the num number of uh, uh, cyber police officers in China. The Golden Shield Project, the so-called Great Firewall of China, greatly, I mean, strictly shield overseas websites that the Chinese communists think are sensitive. And many netizens have been summoned or detained just because they talk about civil society, the constitutionalism, these, um, and they gathered in the same city and talk about uh, the word democracy in their QQ chatting forums. And the Chinese government had trained two million web moderators or censors, censors to delete posted messages and to, quote, guide public opinion, end the quote. Of course, in the past, Four months, the Chinese Communist government have arrested many, even public intellectuals, influential, even business leaders, such as um, Yang Xiuyu, Xue Bei, Xue Bei Chen, and Zhou Lu Bo, and Fu Chunsheng, Dong Li Jie, who is an environmentalist. So the purpose of this operation by the Chinese communists is to warn and punish those influential public intellectuals so that the ordinary, ordinary netizens will not dare to voice their opinions on political or social issues. And furthermore, it seems the Chinese government tried to legalize and legitimize by the court system and the prosecution system, all these uh, crackdowns. And there is a joint verdict, I mean, uh, a document issued, uh, so-called uh, interpretation on several questions on the applicable law on criminal cases of utilizing the internet for slandering. So nowadays, if the government or any police deemed uh, a citizen who just uh, used the Chinese version of Twitter to forward a message of uh, public knowledge or you know, raising the public awareness, if the forwarding has hit over 5,000 hits, it is uh, called the case of serious circumstances that constitutes the crime of slandering is a crime for prosecution. Of course, there are a number of other arrests in suppressing those people who free freely express themselves and peacefully fight for civil rights. And those 
public intellectuals, such as Dr. Xu Zhiying, such as um, a, a billionaire who supports the freedom expression, Mr. Wang Gongquan, such as uh, Yuan Dong, such as uh, Zhang Baochong, such as Hou Xin, such as uh, Ma Xinli. They were all arrested for simply making their opinion known without some without even taking much actions on the street. Of course, at the end of April, Ms. Liu Ping, uh, Wei Zhengping, and Li Shihua, Li Sihua of Xinyu City, Jiangxi Province, whose trial, whose trial was abruptly finished yesterday because of the arbitrary uh, uh, trial and basically the government assigned um, all these illegal uh, procedures and the lawyers have to withdraw themselves. So we have seen this uh, since uh, uh, President Xi Jinping took power. The Chinese government has become more severe in suppressing the rights defenders, restricting the freedom of speech, and controlling the society. Of course, in other areas, like uh, the rule of law, like uh, the religious freedom, have also been uh, worsened. So every day in China, there are thousands of incidents of forced demolition of houses. And every year, that were forced into the black jail and resu uh, resulted with uh, numerous occasions of torture and rape of women. And the Chinese Communist government continue to, su continue to severely suppress the house churches. Of course, uh, since the April of this year, there are more Christians who had faced prosecution and received criminal sentence than the combination of the whole year last year. We have, uh, uh, that has ha been happening uh, from Henan province to inner Mongolia, and the house church um, Christians were s um, sentenced to from two years to seven years imprisonment for simply organizing a peaceful worship service in their own homes. What has aroused the most concern recently is the incident of where the, uh, we in which Peking University dismissed Associate Professor Xia Yeliang, which shows the position of the Chinese government in strictly control, controlling the freedom of speech. Because me, uh, Professor Xia just promoted freedom, uh, China's reform towards, uh, towards the democratic constitutionalism on the internet. So the Peking University simply dismissed him. It is said for us that the status of human rights and rule of law in China is seriously disconcerting. Without human dignity or basic human rights, the modernization of China is worthless. On the contrary, when China is headed toward the opposite direction of universal values, this doubtlessly poses a greater and greater threat to America and to the civilized world. I think when China, instead of suppressing these brave soldiers for freedom, civil society, and democracy, China should embrace them. These individuals, like my friend Guo Fixing, like my friend Gao Zhisheng, like many others who are still sitting in the dark prison, such as uh, Mr. Zhu Yufu, for simply hoping and advancing the very freedom that every human being are cherishing. I think they should be awarded, they should be embraced by the Chinese government, certainly the Chinese people. That will make 
the 21st century a safer and better and much a greater place to, for us to stay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Fu. Uh, I can say, because I remember when you first brought Mr. Guo's family to our attention on the subcommittee and how earnest you were that you would not cease until they were free, it has to be a source of at least some comfort, despite his horrific circumstances that he faces now, that his wife and children are safe. And that is attributable to you. Mr. Kumar. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman and the members of the committee. Amnesty International is extremely pleased to be here to testify on this important issue. There are two issues that we have to consider in this. First, there is an individual who has been arrested for his peaceful, nonviolent political activism. And the bigger picture is U.S. policy towards China, whether it's moving human rights policy towards China, whether it's moving in the right direction or not. First of all, I would like to urge that uh, my full testimony be, uh, be part, of the, part of the record. Thank you very much. Why is Go Fishang singled out and imprisoned? There are thousands who have been imprisoned. But in his case, a couple of issues stand up. He fought against corruption. He fought against trans for, for transparency. He was part of a major new citizens movement that was fighting for justice and equality in China. He was fighting for media freedom by supporting media workers, press workers, uh, against interference in the editorial policy. He also went to the other step of urging China to sign on to the UN Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, ratify it. They signed on, but they didn't ratify it. So we are seeing an individual here who has been fighting the fight for the needy and for justice. The results he received was he was arrested, tortured, electric shocks were used, and he was earlier sentenced to five years in prison. Now he has been arre arrested again, again when he stood up against corruption. This time, for two months, more than two months, no lawyers or the family members were allowed to see him. So it's basically an arbitrary detention that's taking place there. Despite all these things, what we are seeing from our administration is the pressure that's not up to the standard that we have seen earlier. As previously, one of the member of Congress or the commissioner mentioned that after most favored nation was given to China, the leverage for US have gone. We can say that's one of the major reasons China is not worried about US making statements or speaking up. On this issue, we would like to bring to your attention an opportunity by which US can bring up the pressure in a meaningful way. As you are aware, U.S. and China have two different dialogues going on. One is U.S.-China Human Rights Annual Dialogue, which is, from our perspective, Chinese don't take it seriously. It's like a pro forma. Every year, let's talk. Okay, that's it. Nothing happens. There's a serious nature of another dialogue that takes place that is the economic and security dialogue. Secretary of State attends. That's when, when Chen was in prison, he, Secretary Clinton was there for the dialogue. That's why, I mean, the timing was so good that it did a lot of attention. So what we are urging is that Congress should put pressure on, on the administration to make sure that economic and security dialogue also include human rights. 
until and otherwise human rights become part and parcel of economic and security dialogue. Whatever the U.S. says, it's not going to have any impact on, the, on Chinese. So let's see in a practical sense. To, to add this, and as a matter of policy, Secretary of State will be there when human rights is being discussed. They say when, the, when we raise the issue with the administration, they say, oh, we discuss the issue on human rights during the economic and security dialogue. So why are you so hesitant to call it economic security and human rights dialogue? So we urge strongly that Congress take this as a serious issue and exert pressure and pass resolution so that next dialogue that takes place, the dialogue is economic security and human rights dialogue. That's when Chinese will feel the pinch because economy and business is tied to human rights. Security is tied to human rights there. Hopefully, your action, committee's action, and the other actions will bring results to Go Fingxing's case. But we hope that the bigger picture of having a meaningful way so that U.S. can put pressure to fight for equal justice and for human rights in China also have an impact in China. Thank you very much for inviting us. Mr. Kumar, thank you very much for that very practical and incisive recommendation. Um, I, too, have noted that the Human Rights Dialogue has been almost a cordoned off exercise that they, the Chinese side, does not take seriously, even if the intentions on the U.S. side are very well intentioned. Mm -hmm. um, because, and we're seeing the same thing replicated in Vietnam and elsewhere. Uh, it kind of puts it on the sidebar, sidelines, I should say. Uh, and it is not integrated with the security and economic issues. So your point, I think, is extraordinarily well taken. It's worth noting that the U.S.-China, the 18th U.S.-China um, Human Rights Dialogue took place on July 30th to the 31st, and just a few days later, uh, uh, Mr. Guo was arrested uh, again for the fourth time. Uh, so if there was any kind of impact, it certainly was not manifested uh, towards him. Uh, as a result of the human rights dialogue. So I, I think your point is extraordinarily well taken. I, uh, we are joined by Chairman Dana Rohrbacher. Uh, Chairman Rohrbacher, you have anything you'd like to, or would you like to ask questions? Or? Oh, I just, let me just uh, take note. I'm sorry, I have three hearings at one time. I just came from a hearing on Afghanistan. And if there's anything that uh, should indicate to us that we should try to have a high standard on human rights. It's the s situation we get caught in quagmires in different parts of the world. If the United States stands for human rights, and when we have uh, individuals, brave heroic individuals like Fei Shi Shong, uh, that what we're doing by supporting them is letting, the, letting them struggle for freedom. We, it, it, it takes a burden off of our shoulders that we have to send our troops everywhere in the world to try to promote the cause of freedom. The fact is that by we supporting local people and their struggles for whatever tyrannical government they're under, uh, that is a way that it helps the people of the United States because then we no longer have to bear the burden of having to deal with that challenge. And with dictatorships, especially like China, the uh, a, uh, a dictatorship the size of China that abuses its own people obviously has no respect for the rights of other people as well. If, if China does not respect the rights of its own people to the point it won't murder them or, or, or torture them, or, or as we see with the Falun Gong where they pick them up by the thousands and, and, and throw them into, into prison and, and actually murder them for their organs, if, if you have a government like that, over there, that is a threat to all the decent people of the world. Because if they'll do that to their own people, what will they do to foreigners? So we who are foreigners to them uh, know that they, they, here's a threat of a ghoulish group of people who are willing to, to commit horrendous crimes against their own people. And our first line of defense is to support those of you who are struggling against that tyranny. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I am very honored always to sit with you and to stand with you and you, the leadership you've provided on human rights issues, and uh, this, uh, and especially when concerned to China, in which, uh, uh, as we say, uh, uh, if China 
if we can bring a liberalization in China and support those people who are struggling to have decent humane values in China, it will mean a great deal to the security of the United States and the rest of the world. So uh, uh, thank you and, and uh, thank those of you who are struggling uh, to help these people in China. And, uh, and we just want to express unity with you, Mr. Chairman, and with these brave souls who are struggling for a better world. Chairman Rohrbacher, thank you so very much. I think uh, our distinguished witnesses know that Chairman Rohrbacher, before he became a member of the House from California, <clears throat> was a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan and was one of those who put into those speeches some of the most memorable and very enduring concepts concerning fundamental human rights and the freedom agenda. So, uh, and he has continued that ever since as an individual member. I, I really, actually, the President was a great writer. I was wow. just sort of you know that too. But you wrote it too. Thank you so much. Let me ask a couple of questions, and I'll go to Mr. Meadows. Um, Mr. Chen Guan Jen made uh, seven very specific uh, recommendations and observations in his testimony, uh, of course, focusing on, on Mr. Guo uh, and, and his plight uh, and his deep empathy and concern, which we all share. Uh, but on one of those, he talked about the importance of the Internet. Uh, and I would just note parenthetically that I have introduced and reintroduced several times, which is regrettably opposed by the Obama administration, and that is a bill called the Global Online Freedom Act of 2013, H.R. 491, and Mr. Kumar, uh, and Amnesty, and Reporters Without Borders, and many other organizations, NGOs, have endorsed it and supported it over these many years. Uh, part of the requirements of that legislation is to require internet communication providers that are listed on the U.S. stock exchanges to disclose to the Securities and Exchange Commission their human rights due diligence, and that means Chinese companies like Bandi, Bandao and others uh, would have to tell us what they're doing vis-a-vis -vis human rights, and if they are, as we know they are, censoring ad nauseum, that too would have to be disclosed. It prohibits the export of hardware or software that could be used for surveillance, tracking, and blocking uh, to government end users in an internet restricting country, a, 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 a new term that we invent in the bill based on a preponderance of the evidence that they are restricting the internet and surveilling uh, their own people. Uh, and there are other provisions as well. Uh, it, you know, uh, Mr. Chen mentioned Hillary Clinton's statement about the internet and allowing all members of the human race equal access to knowledge and thoughts, but this administration opposes the Global Online Freedom Act, and it would give real substance I believe, uh, to an effort to say, we mean it when we say we want the, the, the internet to be free, that students in China and elsewhere, uh, but especially in China and, and the general public, will have access uh, to an unfettered access to knowledge and information. Secondly, uh, Mr. Chen also mentioned um, the number of very important points, but one of them was about uh, a Magnitsky type of uh, piece of legislation. Um, I think that is an idea whose time has come, but we already have on the books a law that I wrote in 2000 uh, as part of the, uh, a larger piece of legislation that I was the author of called the Admiral Nance Meg Dunham uh, International uh, Relations Act for 2000. And that is to say that anyone who is complicit in the barbaric one child per couple policy and Chen Quan Jen talks about it as being evil and wicked, which it is. It abuses women. There is no greater abuse of women's rights occurring in the world. And the legislation, which is law on the books right now, that is not being enforced by the Obama administration and wasn't even enforced well by the Bush administration, says that anybody who was complicit in those crimes is denied a visa to come to the United States. We asked the Congressional Research Service to look into this last year and found that less than 30 people were penalized by visa denial. Uh, and we know that there are hundreds of thousands throughout China who are visiting this unbelievable agony upon women and destroying children and young babies, especially the girl child, through sex selection and abortion. Uh, so that is a law that has gone unimplemented by the Obama administration. Uh, we will redouble our efforts as we our efforts that we've done over and over. I ask the administration, what are you doing? Why aren't you implementing it? And we get a big blank stare, but we'll continue to try. But I thank you for raising the Matvitsky, and I think as Mr. Kumar and so many others know, 
Uh, it does work when you hold individuals responsible for crimes in a regime that is called a dictatorship. It has a profound impact. I, I wrote a, a law back in 19, uh, 2004 uh, called the Belarus Democracy Act. The mainstay of that law was to hold Lukashenko and his other fellow uh, repressors in Belarus through visa denial and well over 200 people, it's a small country, uh, have been denied visas to come to the United States and the Europeans have followed suit. So it is a model and Mavitsky certainly is working uh, roughly, but it is working vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia today. today. So I thank you for those very specific recommendations, uh, Mr. Chen. Um, I would, I, you know, if there's any further comments, or, and then I'll go to Mr. Meadows, that any of our, our distinguished witnesses would like to make, you certainly laid out the case. We will follow this up with a letter to President Obama. We will include all of your testimony. We will ask him. He is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He has gravitas, the likes of which very few people have in the world, to raise these issues. And certainly now, with, with uh, President Xi Jinping uh, moving aggressively in the other direction, it was already bad uh, under, under um, uh, his predecessor, President um, um, uh, Hu. It has gotten worse, as we all know. Uh, so there needs to be, I think, a revisiting of these issues by the administration. Uh, and, and again, Ms. Ms. Yang, your comments Everyone should read your, as well as your moms, should read those comments and say, you know, a mother and daughter testifying on behalf of their husband and dad uh, with such eloquence and such class um, is so moving. There's so much love coming from you towards your, your father and your husband. And, and my hope is that that will further motivate all of us uh, who often fall asleep uh, and don't do enough to really make a difference. And it, our president needs to step up. Our Congress needs to step up, and uh, we need to do much more. And again, Mr. Kumar, I love your idea of, of the human rights dialogues, well-meaning. They don't work. We need to integrate it into the security and economic. And you're right, the Secretary of State is there, and hopefully Secretary Kerry uh, will take these cases and take them seriously. So I'd like to yield to any of you and then go to Mr. Meadows for any questions you might have. If you wanted to comment on any of that, or I'll go right to Mr. Meadows. I have one question. Um, on September the 30th, I paid a visit to the Department uh, uh, of State and visited some officials there. And我当时要求国务院能够公开发表一个声明，呃，提到郭飞雄的名字。and uh, So I made the request to the Department of State uh, asking them to make a, a public announcement to ask the Chinese uh, government to release uh, Guo Feishong. Uh, 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 but we have not seen any uh, thing that uh, has happened. Yeah, I really hope that the American government can make uh, an announcement. C could you reveal to us who you spoke to, or would you rather not do that? Uh, At Department of State? Uh, Zia. Zia, the undersecretary uh, Zia. Acting. Acting okay. assistant. Uh. Thank you. So you have reached out to the State Department, and so far there has not been a response. Yes. We will follow up on that as well. And, and I would say one statement does not make for a, an intervention. My hope is that uh, as we do on the China Commission, because I'm the co-chair of the China Commission as well, we have a prisoner's list. We advocate for those continuously. Uh, for the release of political and religious prisoners, uh, but we don't see a corresponding, I mean, uh, our ambassador, Gary Locke, should be raising this. Uh, this should be a mainstay of our dialogue with the Chinese, not what is the next deal uh, to sell more of our bonds or some other uh, self-interest. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, Pastor Fu. I have a quick um, comment about the, the follow-up about the 
improve, improving the U.S.-China human rights dialogue, the mechanism. Um, although, I mean, with the end of human rights uh, communities, we basically have concluded with the same conclusion, so, uh, as uh, Chen Guangtong put it nicely, that uh, the, the, the human rights di dialogue has become a human rights empty talk. Um, but, you know, um, I remembered uh, this uh, May when I traveled with uh, uh, Chen Guangtong uh, at uh, the European Parliament, and we met with the EU's highest human rights officer, the uh, former uh, foreign minister for Greece. And um, he, in a, in, a, in a private setting, but he wants us actually to know, that um, uh, when Chen Guangtong was still under house arrest, and one EU uh, diplomat uh, tried to visit him and was beaten up right outside his uh, Deng Shigu village. And instead of uh, making uh, public, you know, uh, I mean, it's a, obviously a, a, a diplomatic, um, you know, a protest is warranted. Um, the EU has uh, waited until the next round of human rights dialogue, the next year, and talked to the Chinese government and said, uh, we, we, why did you beat up our diplomat over there? And um, so we, um, we were sort of uh, very, very concerned uh, that actually, you know, that very incident that a Chinese sort of uh, uh, guards could beat up uh, a EU, sort of a, one of the, the world par most powerful, you know, so sovereign country bloc um, could, could, be, uh, could keep silence of a fellow um, a diplomat who was beaten. I, 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 so, what, you know, after talking with Mr. Chen Guangtong, Chris, we were making suggestions to them, and I think it uh, can apply to the U.S.-China human rights dialogue. Um, one way is to, um, to avoid becoming a show of empty talks is to make the human rights dialogue live streaming, to make it live broadcast. You know, if they want to talk lies, um, actually the, EU, the Chinese talked back to the EU and said, no, Chen Guangtong is free. We didn't beat up your diplomat. Uh, he's, he, he's all right. So I think uh, the reason they can, uh, the Chinese regime can pronounce this uh, blind, I mean, you know, just, uh, just, uh, just lies so, uh, so unshamefully uh, is... Uh, it's a closed door, under the table dialogue. If it's uh, you know, broadcast live, uh, even part of the session, when the diplomats are on the same table, when the Chinese people and American people and the world know what <laughs> we're talking about, uh, and uh, the, if it's a truly, uh, it's a true dialogue, I think it will produce some fruits, or some results, and um, so that's my comment. Mr. Fu, thank you very much. Mr. Meadows. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for your, your testimony. Uh, I know it is very easy to get discouraged. Uh, the chairman has been uh, fighting this fight for many, many years. But I can speak uh, to his character and to his perseverance, and I can tell you he is unyielding in uh, his, truly in his efforts to make sure that justice and fairness and compassion uh, is something that we all hold dear, not only uh, here in the United States, but in China and other nations abroad. So I, I wanna give you that encouragement. I am a little, um, little concerned because we, we continue to have hearings over and over again and, and we ask for action items and we try to take those action items and, and then not much happens with them. So Pastor Fu, uh, let me make sure I understand you. You're saying that once we have these, these hearings, if we were to televise uh, those live, that they might have some, some impact in terms of the human rights violations. That's right. All right. 
uh, we were in a hearing uh, with uh, just the other day where we talked about uh, some of the media and how the truth is just not getting out. Not only in China, but it's really not getting out to us as well in terms of what's happening there with regards uh, of media personnel within China. If they report negatively, uh, many times their visas do not get renewed or they get delayed for uh, long periods of time. Would you agree that that is an accurate reflection of what's happening in China? I would not necessarily agree that is um, the um, that happens, uh, you know, every time or, or all the time, and uh, actually, as uh, Chairman Smith and uh, the also Congressman Frank Wolf recalled, um, remember in the before the uh, Beijing Olympics, I remembered, um, of course, you know, they are the known sort of called critics of uh, China's human rights uh, right. on the record. And uh, when they apply for visas, yeah, they slow down a little bit, but still give you visas. And uh, yeah, you, you, you still were able to get to China, right? I, I think um, these are peripheral concerns. I think the main concern and of course, uh, as a former teacher who t used to teach um, in the Chinese Communist Party school, I think uh, I know the Communist Party's uh, mentality is actually the weaker or the more you yield, the, the, you know, the, the, the weaker you, know, you show uh, to, to them, actually uh, the more they feel they are impoverished or more aggressive. So what you're saying is we need to take a more forceful hand in terms of uh, the penalties of not complying, that uh, we need to set laws and the, and, and the State Department needs to be more forceful in terms of the potential consequences. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, after all, this is uh, um, the two great powers and it's not, uh, you know, nobody, nobody wants to have a mutual destruction. Right. Um, but at the same time, we can't forget our very uh, fundamental values uh, that founded this country. If by just uh, ignoring or just uh, silencing or put human rights under the table, uh, to modernizing uh, this very important uh, fundamental issue. All right. Let me ask you perhaps a more difficult question. Uh, do the Chinese people uh, as a whole see us as being critical of human rights? Uh, being synonymous with us being critical of them uh, as a national country or their economic, do they see those as when we're critical of human rights, being critical of them as a people? Although the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda machine wants to make the Chinese regime, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, uh, one in the same. Yeah, with uh, Chinese people try to mess up the, uh, the idea. I think the Chinese people can make that distinction. And it, it is uh, really the Chinese regime uh, who carry out this repressive uh, uh, policies. It is uh, the uh, brutal policies uh, that um, is used by the, uh, these torturers who torture uh, uh, Mr. Guo Feixing, Mr. Gao Zhisheng. So I think the Chinese people can make the distinction. Like even today's hearing, uh, I mean, with the social media and the Chinese internet, there will be uh, millions of Chinese people uh, who will know and uh, who will, uh, even many will find the video. Uh, so, th so what you're saying is, is that the Chinese people would, would know that the members of Congress uh, have a, a warm feeling towards them, they, we just condemn the action of these human rights violations. Yeah, not only, of course, the warm feelings, but also they know that they are not fighting for freedom alone. They know you are uh, in solidarity, you know, they're American them. friends, okay. uh, in, you know, ten, in thousands of miles away, who are concerned about their prisoners, about right. uh, their fellow uh, relatives who are arbitrarily arrested. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Kumar, let me go to you because in previous testimony, and then I heard it again as a reoccurring theme today, 
you talked about the need for the State Department primarily to tie the human rights and the economic viability, those together. Um, obviously, we haven't done a very good job of that to date. Well, you know, we've had a lot of rhetoric, although I do believe the State Department has a sincere desire uh, to affect human rights. It is a balancing act that many times they look at the economic uh, impact versus human rights and trying to evaluate those two. How do we do a better job of tying those two together in terms of, would it be to look at denying visas? Would it be, how, how can we do that in terms of making a real impact? Uh, our assessment is that uh, the Chinese government take economic and security dialogue very, very seriously. It's the highest level. Secretary of State from our side and the Foreign Minister of Chinese come together and discuss issues. They discuss economic issues and security issues together. They are tying those together. Okay. But they are not tying human rights into that mix. They are having the human rights dialogue separate from that. That's why we are urging that human rights be part and partial of this economic and security dialogue, not stand alone. When you do it stand alone, they will come, they will talk, but the pinch is not there. They're not getting the pressure. The only way they will take human rights seriously. So how, how do we do that? How do we take human rights and make a penalty for not complying? Because the chairman and I have been in meetings uh, with uh, uh, groups from China, part of the Chinese government, and, and their comment to the chairman and to me was, oh, we're making great progress and that you are just misinformed. Uh, is, is essentially what they told Chairman Smith, that he was misinformed, uh, that they were making great strides. So, ha so how do we tie those two together? No, the point is, um, if they have made any strides, of course there are certain areas, like death penalty, they have made some improvements. Earlier it was 80% of the world's population, world's executions were taking place in China. Right until China changed, due to a lot of pressure from outside and also inside, uh, to make sure that uh, there is an, another review before someone is getting executed by the Supreme Court. But because of that reason, the, the death penalty drops to 50%, even though it's still the highest in the world. All the countries put together, it's the highest. Okay. Uh, the issue of how to make change from U.S. in this case, the only country by the way, Congressman, that China will take it seriously is the U.S., the only superpower left, and they want to have good relations with, uh, with, uh, with the U.S. They don't, they don't want to burn bridges for something they can do, which is for their own interest, that the U.S. So our suggestion is that it, the human rights issues should be tied to these two issues, economic and security issues. Sanction issues are slightly different. It's, it's right. when you, every year when they have a dialogue, like earlier it's most favored nations, every year they will have to debate in the Congress, and at that time all kind of human rights issues are debated. Then Congress authorizes it. If the human rights situation goes down, Chinese fears that they may not get that most favored nation status uh, renewed. You know, that's the, that's the leverage that... Uh, that was dropped, uh, actually under Clinton administration, that was dropped. So the, the other alternative that we are saying is that there is another dialogue taking place, even though that's not, no sanction related. The mere fact, the highest levels of U.S. administration, the foreign ministry, that's the Secretary of State, in this case, Secretary Kerry will be there raising the issues, not Human Rights Bureau, and right. in the Human Rights Bureau. There is one good example we had to see. Chen's case, Chen, who, who right. testified. Secretary Clinton was there for the economic security dialogue. So happened, the whole issue blew up there. And, you know, you are hearing, uh, Chairman, you know, I also testified when he was making a pill on his phone from the hospital bed. That put pressure on Secretary Clinton to have some decision. And so in turn, they exert pressure. And we have seen him released. Mm -hmm. So what it shows is, if the pressure goes in a meaningful way in the, in the highest levels, then it will have some impact. 
So you're saying at the secretary level or the undersecretary level and just make sure that they're at those high levels. High level, but the way you tie is you tie human rights with economic and security dialogue. Okay. That's okay. when they will take it seriously. That's missing. We raised it. Administration is reluctant. Where they know Chinese will not like it. Okay. All right. Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge me for one more question, if that would be all right. Uh, I assume that it is. So, um, <laughs> Um, I wanted uh, one of the understandings that I have is when we have events, whether it be arrest or whether it be uh, rebellion, whether it be a protest, that social media and everything, uh, you know, lights up, it flickers up. And then at that particular time that there is, uh, you know, just an oppressive uh, on the Internet freedom, it gets really there has to be a desire to jump the firewall, so to speak, to allow that message to continue to get out. We heard the other day, or I heard in a briefing the other day, that once we jump the firewall, that many times they are subject to cyber attacks, uh, almost instantaneously at the same time, again, to suppress uh, the freedom of the press or the freedom of speech from sharing that. Would you agree that that is a significant problem? And if we could address that with additional server capacity, would that help uh, the Chinese people uh, share the story? Either one of you, Pastor Fu or? Yeah, I, I think um, the, um, the public uh, meeting and also uh, statement mentioning specific names, um, I think, you know, that will really um, demonstrate a true leadership. Uh, you know, like, like the case um, of um, even Chen Guangtong, uh, like Gao Zhisheng. Um, you know, the, I remembered uh, months ago, I mean, um, with Jared Ganser, you know, the, the president of Freedom Now, who actually yesterday, right, had a uh, op-ed at the Washington right. Post. Um, we, we together met with uh, uh, President Obama's top human rights officer um, next to, uh, near the White House. And basically our key demand or key point is, uh, you know, President Obama, uh, y you know, he can just basically use his uh, presidential leverage to tell the, or you know, even privately communicate with the Chinese, and in a even face-saving manner, said, "Look, you know, this is a, a concern not only to me but to the American people. You know, the torture, the arbitrary arrest, and you know, for Gao Zhisheng, for you know, and the Nobel fellow, Nobel Peace winner Liu Xiaobo, and of course, uh, uh, Mr. Guo Fixing. I mean, all these cases." And their family members are here. They are at the door of the White House. And if uh, you don't release them, uh, I will meet, uh, meet with them. And if in fact, uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, John Banner, and the Minority Leader, Nancy Pelosi, twice already, I, I know um, for a fact, uh, uh, along with several committee chairmen, uh, including uh, Chairman Smith, uh, write letter to President Obama asking him to meet with Gao's wife. Right. Asking him, you know, to meet with Chen Guangtong. And so far, even not a cabinet level member had ever even met with this, you know, the family members. I think the Chinese are watching. The Chinese, of course, are observing, you know, whether that is the priority, whether in the administration. Well, perhaps we can call on the president's compassion for people and uh, encourage that uh, even today. So, but I thank you, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I appreciate your interest. Uh, uh, Mr. Meadows, thank you. Yes, I uh, want just Mr. to correct one record. Uh, I think um, uh, I got to know uh, uh, the acting assistant secretary, uh, Ms. Zaya, she did mention uh, Yao Modong's name last week at uh, um, China's uh, the UN UPR review uh, in Geneva, and um, so that is the only name mentioned uh, by any other country. Um, of course, Chinese ambassador rejected that uh, immediately. Um, so wants to keep that record straight. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we do have votes. Yes, Ms. Yang. 
嗯，呃，我非常感谢这个呃，史密斯主席今天给我们这个呃郭飞雄开了一个这个听证会，我很感谢。I'm very thankful to、uh, Chairman Mr. Smith.、Uh, you gave us this hearing opportunity、uh, on my husband's Guo Feixiong's behalf. 呃，我希望这次听证会能够呃做一些有效的工作，呃，能够嗯、呃、帮助郭飞雄的案子。I hope that this hearing can produce some positive result、uh, to help my、uh, husband. 希望美国政府和美国国会能够及时的干预这郭飞雄的案子，能够促进郭飞雄尽快自由。And I hope that the Congress and the, the administration can work together and、uh, for、uh, the earlier release my, of my husband. Zhang, thank you so much.、Um, again, your bravery and that of your daughter,、uh, it just mirrors that of your husband,、uh, and it's an inspiration to all of us. You know, we begin every single session of Congress with a prayer. I think it would be most fitting, especially now since the cruelty in China has escalated. It's already been it's been bad for so long, and many of you have suffered from it, Pastor Fu.、Uh, but it would be very appropriate if Pastor Fu, you could just lead us in a very brief prayer、uh, for the freedom of this wonderful husband and father, Gao Zhejiang. And others who are suffering the barbarity of this 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 regime in Beijing, if you could just lead us in that, and that'll be the closing of the hearing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to testify for the truth about freedom, about democracy, about all these、uh, brave spirits. That we know that every human being is created with your image, which give us the true source of dignity and equality and justice. <coughs> so, as we are created equal, and we can seek justice and justice for all. Lord, we thank you for this great country, a country that has been founded. By the founding fathers, with this、um, the great constitution, with the guarantee of the freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, Lord, we cannot take this for granted, because as your servant Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Lord, may you let Us to be a voice for these voiceless, because in the end, those victims, those who are silent, will remember not the words of the enemy, but the silence of their friends. Lord, may you use this panel, use the member of Congress, use the leadership of、um, the great. United States of America, and we and use the leadership of President Obama and the Secretary Secretary of State John Kerry to be a vehicle to not only advance the business trade interests of America, but more importantly, advance the freedom, democracy, and the, the human dignity, the values of the of this universal. Imperative throughout the world, and the end of the day, we do not live by food and water and worldly entertainment only. But more importantly, we live to glorify you and to love our neighbor and to love each other. May you grant freedom of Guo Feixing sooner. May you grant freedom of Gao Zhisheng sooner. May you grant freedom of many others sooner, using us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The hearing is adjourned. <laughs>